Open your Bibles as we get started here today to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3, the title of our message, The Wisest Fool. The Wisest Fool. Mm. Last week, we talked about Solomon, gave the illustration uh, uh, that the Bible gives an example of his wisdom, of the two women who lived together, had babies three days apart, and one baby, uh, one baby died, and uh, they were arguing over whose baby the living baby was, and how Solomon saved the baby, delivered it to be able to grow up with its real mother. Solomon would then fall so far from God that he goes from saving a baby to building pagan temples for babies to be sacrificed in. Solomon began to be self-sufficient. He exalted reason above the Word of God and began participating in pagan worship for false gods. The question isn't, did it happen? The question is, how did this happen? How do you go from being all in for God, and by the way, being the wisest person who had ever lived, the wisest, as far as we know, that's ever lived, save Jesus, and dedicated to God, and fall the way Solomon did. How can this happen? And what is the lesson for us today? So gradual was Solomon's apostasy that before he was aware of it, he had wandered far from God. Almost, what's that next word? Imperceptibly, he began to trust less and less in divine guidance and blessing and to put confidence in his own strength. So it was gradual. It didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen all at once. How did Solomon fall? We discover many clues, many downward steps in Solomon's demise. We're going to look at a few of them here today. 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. We'll read here starting in verse 1 of 1 Kings chapter 3. And it says here, Now Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married Pharaoh's daughter. Then he brought her to the city of David till he had finished building his own house in the house of the Lord and the wall all around Jerusalem. You say, is this a problem? Yeah, this is a problem. But from an earthly perspective, from a worldly perspective, folks might consider this a smart or wise thing to do. The most powerful nation nearby was Egypt. To marry <clears throat> Pharaoh's daughter and have a treaty, well, that was something that would be done in ancient times. And it was kind of an assurance, we're going to live together in peace. You don't really expect Pharaoh to then, you know, make war against his grandkids in five years, do you? And so it was something that was common. It would help build alliances, help prevent war, and common practice among uh, ancient nations. But it wasn't something that was considered uh, blessed by God. It says here, from a human point of view, this marriage though contrary to the teachings of God's law, God's law seemed to prove a blessing. But in forming an alliance with a heathen nation and sealing the compact by marriage with an idolatrous princess, Solomon rashly disregarded the wise provision that God had made for maintaining the purity of his people. The hope that this Egyptian wife might be converted was but a feeble excuse for the sin. Wow! And she was converted, and he was emboldened. Sometimes that, oh, I'm going to date and marry someone that doesn't believe as I do, ends up working out, and sometimes it doesn't. 
Solomon, it worked with him one time, for him one time, so he tried it about 700 more times and it didn't work. And Solomon would discover this truth in years to come. Look here in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. It says here, Meanwhile, the people sacrificed at the high places because there was no house built for the name of the Lord until those days. Now, so ancient Israel, they would make sacrifices, give sacrifices unto God, and they would go up to the tops of the mountains to do it. There wasn't a temple built. In fact, Solomon was going to lead out in building this temple. Remember, David was going to build the temple. And uh, God told David, you've been a man of blood. You've got to wait. Your son's going to build it. So there's no temple yet. So where did Israel go to make their sacrifices? Up on tops of the mountains. But what else was taking place at the tops of the mountains? That's where the pagans went to also offer sacrifice to the pagan gods. Okay? Now, now this is a, a serious thing to consider. Read, read the next part. It says here to Solomon, of Solomon, verse 3. Solomon loved... Kids, are y'all counting Solomon every time I say Solomon? Are you marking it down? Here it is. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, except that he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. Now, that's where people had to do it. There was no temple. But that word except there just kind of stands out, doesn't it? He loved the Lord. But he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. So he loved going there. Now, as we move ahead, we're going to see, see something else that begins to develop. Just some little cracks where Solomon was beginning to trust in his own plan instead of going and seeking God. Now, we all have a tendency to do that when we think we just know what to do. We all tend to go and seek God's wisdom when we think we need it. But when we think we know what to do next, we generally just do it, right? Be honest. When we need to learn to depend more and more upon God all the time. So 2 Chronicles 2.3. 2 Chronicles. So you got 1 and 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. Let's look here. 2 Chronicles. Check this out. 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 3. And it says here in 2 Chronicles 2 and verse 3, Then Solomon sent to Hiram, king of Tyre, saying, As you have dealt with David my father, and sent him cedars to build himself a house to dwell in, so deal with me. And then in verse 8, he says, Also send me cedar and cypress and algum logs from Lebanon, for I know that your servants have skill to cut timber. And so he was needing supplies from Hiram, king of Tyre. Notice in verse 3, Solomon sent to Hiram. Just a little, little piece of personal history for me. is um, Right here in these chapters, there's Hiram, king of Tyre, and then Hiram, the master mason. We'll get to that in just a moment. And Solomon. My name is Hiram Solly. And Solly is actually a derivative of Solomon, or short for Solomon. It was my grandpa's name, and it was my uncle's name, and it's my name. Did someone back there say, hey, these two names are right here together in the Bible, Hiram and Solly, and let's use them? I'll never know, because there's nobody alive that knows the answer to that question. But I've certainly wondered it, right? And so, we look here, and notice verse 7. This one is off the rails. Therefore, send me at once a man skillful to work in gold and silver and bronze and iron and purple and crimson and blue who has skill to engrave with the skillful men who are with me in Judah and Jerusalem, who David my father provided. You know, he probably thought here, I know what to do. I'm a smart guy. I've been given wisdom. Let's get the guy that's the best in the business. Because we're building the best structure. But with the ancient temple that was built, how did those guys get so skilled? They were blessed by God to be so skillful. Instead of seeking from among the people someone whose heart was in it from the standpoint of they believed this and they were building a temple to the Lord and they were doing a work for the Lord, Solomon sent for a foreigner who was already skilled. 
That's actually, as you study it out, a lack of confidence that God would provide from among His own people someone with the skill to do the job. Now, he sends him someone also named Hiram. Notice verse 13. Now I have sent a skillful man endowed with understanding, Huram, my master craftsman. And if you look at a Bible with a marginal reference, it's spelled, uh, it's Hiram. I think the, uh, the translators uh, changed it just slightly here uh, because other translations say Hiram just to, div- just to differentiate between Hiram the king and Hiram the master craftsman. And then the name Hiram after this generation ceases to exist and it pops up again i guess in the 1800s and a few folks used it all right now as we move ahead here uh, that was an issue no issue in seeking necessary materials but the wilderness sanctuary god gifted his people to be skilled craftsmen to do the job and solomon sought for an outside craftsman instead of relying on god this is just one little hint of solomon having self-reliance and making decisions where he should have sought god's leading we'll see this begin to develop some more look in first kings 10 and verse 14 first kings 10 and verse 14 1 Kings 10 and verse 14. We have to be careful. We can do the same thing as Solomon where we think we know what to do and instead of seeking God's guidance on things we should, we just make decisions and we just do what we think is best. What Solomon began to do here in his self-reliance was to do in his own wisdom what he thought was best for God instead of relying upon God's leading and upon the Scripture to guide. And so 1 Kings 10 and verse 14. The weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents of gold. That's the only reference I'm aware of outside of Revelation of 666, at least that way. But that was his annual salary in gold. Now, that's 666 talents. A talent is about 70 pounds. So 666 times 70 is 46,620 pounds of gold. That wasn't a lifetime accumulation. That was an annual income. (laughs) Yeah, pretty crazy, huh? Now, notice Deuteronomy 17 and verse 14. Deuteronomy 17 and verse 14. We're getting ready, we're setting something up here in Deuteronomy 17 for the next three things we're going to read about. And then we're going to have to have our kids come up and help us, right? Harper and Tristan, not yet, not yet, you're on call, you're on deck, all right? And so, Deuteronomy 17. And it says here, Deuteronomy 17, and... uh, Verse 14, when you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you. So God's saying, I know you're going to have a king. When you do, verse 16, but he shall not multiply horses for himself nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses for the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Okay. Then, verse 17, neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Don't multiply horses, don't multiply wives, and don't multiply silver and gold. We're dealing with a bit of a problem here. Would Solomon have been aware of these words? Well, Solomon was only the third king of Israel. You had Saul, David, Solomon. And notice what it says here in verse 18. Also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from uh, the one before the priest, the Levites, and it shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. So the king is supposed to actually have you know, gone through the Torah and wrote up things that he needs to be reminded of, including this, so that it's ever before him. That's kind of interesting. Did you know that? Now, go with me to 1 Kings 10. How did he do with this? 1 Kings chapter 10. 
And we're going to see here starting, oh, 1 Kings 10, let's go to verse 26. 1 Kings 10 and verse 26. Check it out here. 1 Kings 10, 26. And Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen. He gathered what? Chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen, whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king at Jerusalem. Then the king made silver as common as stones, and he made the cedar trees as abundant as sycamores, which are in the lowlands. Also Solomon had horses imported from Egypt in Keve. The king's merchants bought them in Keve at the current price. Now a chariot that was imported from Egypt cost 600 shekels of silver and a horse 150. And thus, through their agents, they exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria. So he gathered up horses, but they were buying and reselling. So they gathered up a massive amount, which they kept on hand. But I guess he's reasoning, though God said don't gather up a bunch of horses, don't multiply horses to yourself, that would be a symbol of prestige in ancient times. That would be like a wealthy man saying, come over to my warehouse. and you walk. I've actually walked in a warehouse like this one time in my life. Where I went into this very common looking building and there were about 17 classic cars. All dolled up and fixed up. You would never know it by looking at the outside of the building. And then some people will have like, a hundred of them or something, right? And so, multiplying horses to yourself as a king, that was the equivalent of having a massive collection of classic cars and muscle cars and sports cars. And, and that was what he was doing. But he was also buying them at one price and selling them for another. That's how you make money, right? Buy cheap, sell high. Well, that's what he was doing as well. But God told him not to do it. And he should have had a book there that, that told him and reminded him that he read regular not to do this kind of thing. And we're going to look at the other two in just a moment. But the affluence that Solomon was dealing with began to cause things to be more difficult for him. Most of us live under the lie that if we had more, life would be better. The Bible calls this the deceitfulness of riches. It is actually more difficult to have a good life that honors God when you become very affluent. Scripture bears this out. It even goes so far as to talk about how hard it is for a rich man to enter heaven. Although it says with God all things are possible. Okay? But let's think about this just for a moment. Uh, we're going to have uh, Tristan and Harper come up right now to help us. They're going to... Uh, Walk across the stage. It's not a running race, but a walking race. Okay? Come around, on, come around on up here. Both of you, get a glass. Okay? All right. Now, now, Harper, you're taller, you're older, you're bigger, your legs are longer. You think you can take him in a race? You think you can go faster than him? Okay, now there's one rule to the race. Come over here, kiddos. All right. Both of you get some water. Let's go pour the water down here on the carpet. Just seems, seems better. All right. So, you got, to, you got to walk with water in your glass, and you can't spill any water. That's the rule. Okay? Now, do y'all think y'all could, could walk right now and not spill any water? Well, hold on a second. We're not done yet. Tristan, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna load it for you. Okay? Here, here's what we're going to do. Harper, you get more water. This is like riches and affluence. All right, you get that much water. Now, y'all are going to race, but if you spill water, you lose. Okay, are you ready? Okay. The first one that can get all the way over, wait, 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 all the way to me without spilling any water. You can't run. We're in church. You're going to walk. You can walk fast, though. Harper, I don't know that you should try to walk fast. It's the one that can get... You can't spill any water. you got to get over here without spilling water. On your mark, get set, walk. 
Oh, water dripped. <laughs> All right, Tristan's our winner. Let's give them both a hand. Thank you. Thank you. The illustration is clear. People think, if only I had more, if only I had more. But when you end up more affluent, you've got more issues assailing you. You've got more things to deal with. You've, your cup's running over, and you've got to be more careful to keep all the water in the cup. We think, oh, if I could win the lottery. Have you seen how that's... Well, first of all, you shouldn't be buying a lottery ticket. Okay, But <laughs> have you not read and seen how that has absolutely ruined people to, to have that much, you know? And so not that, not that there aren't godly people of means and wealth like Abraham and Job and others that God richly blesses. But there, there are more temptations that come. For the most part, people's lives are not better because they became grossly affluent. It was a challenge for Solomon. It was part of what affected him. So he's got stalls and stalls of horses. That would be like you having stall, uh, you know, buildings and buildings of classic cars. And then 1 Kings 11 now. 1 Kings chapter 11. Let's look. 1 Kings chapter 11. And it says here, 1 Kings 11, we're going to start in verse 1. First Kings 11, 1. And it says here, so it's just talked about the horses. We just read verses, uh, uh, the previous verses there in chapter 10, 26 through 29. And now the next verse, chapter 11, verse 1. But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonites, and Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. Well, he goes, I'm the wisest guy there's ever been. I've already married one heathen woman and and converted her to Judaism. I can do it again. And again and again. And yet, Scripture said if you do it, your heart's going to be turned away from God. He thought he was wise enough to do what God said, if you do, you're in danger. Do you ever get too smart to follow God's word? That's how Solomon became the wisest fool. He thought his wisdom could deliver him from what maybe it wouldn't deliver other people. Let's look here and read on. It says in verse 3, and he had 700 wives, princesses. So most of these, maybe all of these, would come through treaties and agreements, you know. And, and back then, you've got to remember, we look at the map now and go, there's not 700 countries. But back then was a time where you also had city-states. City-states meaning a nation could be as small as a city in its surrounding area. So yeah. He had 700, then it says, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, also known as Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites. And to Milcom or Molech, that would be live human sacrifice as part of the worship for that false deity. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as his, did his father David. Then Solomon built. So he builds a temple for God. Now he's building temples for false gods. Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem. And for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And so on one hill, he's built the temple of the Lord. And on a competing hill outside of Jerusalem, he's now built places for false worship, for false gods. 
It says, verse 8, And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. So initially he did this under the pretense of, well, you know, I got to, you know, they're here and that's their belief and I need to support them in what they're doing. But it became commonplace. Something that had been abhorrent idol worship to Solomon. He was now around it so much it became commonplace. And then we read on, and it says, verse 9, So the Lord, we're in 1 Kings 10, 9, So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart turned from the Lord God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. And he commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Wow. Now go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon after what we're talking about right here. Interestingly enough. Last week we talked about the wisdom of Solomon. This week we're talking about the apostasy of Solomon. Next week we talk about the repentance of Solomon. Okay? Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 1.1, the words of the preacher, the who? Son of David, king in Jerusalem. So, who's the son of David that was king in Jerusalem? This is talking about Solomon. Notice chapter 2 and verse 10. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Whatever he wanted, he bought. Whatever he wanted, he got. Whatever he wanted to do, he did. And he had... 46,000 pounds of gold a year at his expense to do it. And he did whatever he wanted to do. Is that what leads to happiness? Notice verse 17. We're in Ecclesiastes 2.17. Therefore I hated life, because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me. For all is vanity and grasping at the wind. Then I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. Wow. You find in Solomon's life, he went after all the pleasures. He had all the wealth. He had all the fame that anyone could have. And he did whatever his heart desired to do. And where did it lead him? To absolute misery you can't serve two masters notice this solomon was endued with wonderful wisdom but the world drew him away from god men today are no stronger than he they might i say we are as prone to yield to the influences that cause his downfall as god warned solomon of his danger so he warns us today his children, not to imperil their souls by affinity with the world. Matthew 6.24 says, You cannot serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or cling to the one and despise the other. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18 says, Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. You see, for Solomon, it, it really, this is where it took off. Yeah, he made a treaty he shouldn't have made and took a wife from Egypt. Yeah, that was a problem. Yeah, he sought for people to work on the temple that were foreigners as opposed to looking for a leader that would be raised up from among the people of God. I mean, he was, he was part, uh, Hiram uh, the master mason was part Jewish. But he was also a man of Tyre as well. Uh, the, these were issues, but those, those were ones that, you know, with God's grace and saying, I made a mistake, there, there's still some good potential there. But when he, he began to bring all these women in with uh, their false beliefs, he was around idolatry all the time. At first, he would have thought, they're heathens. They're off the reservation, but it was around him. 
He went from abhorrence to what? Acceptance. There are satanic agendas at work today being brought into our homes if we're not careful. Through internet and television, Satan will take things that the Christian should view as abhorrent and make it commonplace in your mind right in your home. You don't have to import 700 wives from all the heathen lands. You got 700 channels to do that. Think about it. Things that were once abhorrent are now seen as commonplace. Do you remember some things? Maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago? And you still kind of know they're wrong right now, but they were abhorrent to you 20, 30, 40 years ago? But maybe if you've been watching television, just listening to the media, everything else, now it's just normal. That's how it worked for Solomon. And, but then, for him, it went beyond that. This is encouraging, though. That's how Solomon fell. Yet the Lord forsook him not. By messages of reproof and severe judgments. I mean, we're talking about the apostasy of Solomon this week. Last week is wisdom. This week is apostasy. Next week is repentance. But just stopping right there would not be good. Yet the Lord forsook him not. By messages of reproof and severe judgments, he sought to arouse the king to a realization of the sinfulness of his course. God had not utterly cut him off, but stood ready to deliver him from a bondage more cruel than the grave. He had to be absolutely miserable, having spent tons of money on all kinds of pleasures, only to realize it's all emptiness, as he said, it's all vanity. And then to think that's all that's left in life, just to wait to die, because that's not fun anymore. That's called a bondage more cruel than the grave. And from which he had no power to free himself. That's another thing that can happen to us if we're not careful. We compromise, we compromise, we compromise. We began to like something so much. We have squelched our conscience and seared it so much that we realize we need to change and we need to stop, but now we can't. Some things that is called addiction in some areas these days. But it's an addiction to sin. And he had found himself having no power to stop. But I want you to notice that first sentence on that quote. Yet the Lord forsook him not. The thing is, he was going to be in for some misery now to wake him up and bring him back for his own good. Next week we're going to talk about the repentance. But today... Perhaps there's someone here and some sin has a hold on you. You've known for a while you need to let it go and you can't seem to do so. You can reach a place in life where you say, I can't do it. But you can look at Solomon and you can say, Lord, don't forsake me. Lord, do whatever it takes to free me from this. Yeah, it may be some hard times. It may be some, you know, sometimes drug, druggies and different ones, people with drug addictions, they have to hit what's called what? have to hit bottom lord in my sin i need to hit bottom if that's what i need to do but save me from my sin and god was willing with solomon to do what needed to be done to save him and if you seek him even if you say lord i'm paralyzed in my sin i need you to step in and save me from it no matter what now now that's a serious prayer you're saying, Lord, I give you permission to, to make this a bumpy ride if that's what needs to be to get me safely from this life into your kingdom. But that's a prayer you can pray. And God will answer that prayer. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you you don't give up on us. We thank you that as we look here that, that Solomon is one that we can learn from uh, uh, what he did. And Lord, we ask that you help us not go down those same paths. That if there are those here that are in the grips of sin today, that they know that you forsake them not, but that you seek them and that you will 
work in their life and in their circumstances to help free them from the bonds that they forged and to save them in your kingdom. We ask that you save us all in your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.